covered by the blood? Amen. That's what I can testify to. I was uh, thinking of an evangelist that I used to hear on the radio. I'm not going to give his name because somebody will tell me after church, did you know what about him? <laughs> but he did have a good habit that uh, came to my mind uh, this afternoon. Um, when it came time for prayer, he would say, I'm going into the prayer closet and I'm shutting the door. And I like that, and it stuck with me. I don't know a thing he said, I don't know a thing he preached, but I remember that. And, um, you know, if we could even do that about worship, if we could really come inside, really shut the door, we could really worship. It's so easy for us to go down little trails while we're trying to worship. And uh, I've had people tell me, don't ever say that thing in the pulpit because I immediately leave church. Well, you can't remember all that if you're a pastor and you're going to say something. But uh, let's just try to shut the door. Of course, shall we stand together for it? How we thank you, our Father, for this privilege of being in your house among your people, people who love you, people who are interested in each other and interested in those who are lost. We pray that you will just help us in this service to be truly shut in with you. And may we be lost in your presence for just a little while this evening. And we will praise you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah, you can say standing. <laughs> 212. My youngest son requested this song, so I couldn't refuse. 212. <laughs>
praise the Lord. Amen. Very good. Yes, Jim. Step out and say, Lord, this is what I'm dealing with, and I'm dealing with you, and I'm going to settle these issues and go serve you. Praise the Lord. And tell us about it. Thank you. We're going to pray together. David Webb, will you lead us in prayer tonight as we pray? Several requests we've mentioned this morning, and some new ones. Sherry Martin only mentions two of her nephews that have serious surgery, one, I think, for stomach cancer, and another for blockage, possible blockage in his heart. So we to nephews of Sherry, and uh, I want us to continue to pray for Josh Stamper to leave his internship at Beaver Town. Thank the Lord, Scott, good to have you tonight. He tells me God helped me to preach this morning, so Scott, I want you to put that sermon on schedule for here sometime soon, all right? <laughs> I'm serious about that, but uh, I'm going to preach here before long. But thank God for his help. We prayed for him this morning. We want to continue to remember Esther Byer, we went to Honduras. Uh, where's this device? Is that this week? This, this week. Yeah. Oh, uh, Tuesday. All right. So we're going to do a VBS there. And uh, Honduras is kind of in her future, too. So uh, he's getting her feet wet good. So let's remember that. The Albertson's grandson, let's remember him as we pray, facing surgery before very long. And uh, we want to remember Marvin Stammer and Brother Sandy. I visited both of them this afternoon. And uh, let me just say this first about Marvin. Stamper. Uh, Marvin is a different man than he was just for several weeks. He'd been a sick man. And uh, he said something about him. He said, that I was just afraid this was this is the end for you. 
I said, well, Marvin, last Sunday, you looked, you looked like a sick man. And I'm so grateful. It's just like a transformation in his countenance, in his appearance, in his, his uh, color. And uh, I'm grateful for that. So uh, continue to pray. Marvin still faces another surgery. And, uh, and they're trying to make sure they conquer the infection. And you can just tell he's, he's not fighting that infection like he was. His body's uh, fighting that off. And we're grateful. Thank God for his touch on heart. Brother Sankey needs our prayer. Brother Sankey has an infection in his lungs, is what they determine. And uh, I don't know how they determine that, but Sister Sankey, of course, in her medical background, can rattle off those names. And I can't repeat the names, but they sound very serious to me, especially since they made me put on a suit and rubber gloves to go in the room. But uh, but he's, he's, bad. he's feeling better, but he's battling these infections antibiotics and steroids and it's on oxygen. So let's remember brother and sister Sankey and ask God to visit them and get around them and give them encouragement and brother Sankey with physical touch. Mike here continues to need our prayers. Let's uh, pray that God will help Mike go to the doctor on Tuesday and uh, he said I was supposed to wait for the 13th and I called that doctor and said I gotta have help. You gotta let me come see what's going on. So let's pray for Mike and been discouraged with it all. <coughs> And you can understand he would be because he had the surgery back in October and still struggling with it. So let's pray for Mike and Pat as we pray. All right. Any other special requests? Seems like I'm forgetting some sister. Uh, Joyce Cooper is under the weather. Not terribly sick, but under the weather at least. And let's remember Joyce as we pray. And I know the armors have sickness as well. Sister Michelle. Several have asked about Shemekia's group visit and help and work out details we can't work out. All right, any other spoken requests? Yes. Yes. Brianna Emery, did she fall out of bed? Is that what it was? At UCAN and uh, had a confession. I'm not sure what I'm going to small brain bleed. And uh, so let's she just, what, 11, 11 years old? So let's remember Brianna Emery. Continue to remember the young people. Made progress, not just ours, but across the country. Lots of young people made that progress in U Camp, Pilgrim U Camp, and IHYC, and others. And so let's remember all of these. Oh, maybe you have an unspoken bird by a praise team. Let's stand together. We pray for the table. What will lead us? Let's live together and see the praise team. Yeah. 
Remember, you uh, may contribute to the offering in the entryway, and uh, please uh, leave the offering there. Let's remember our regular services Wednesday night at 7. And then uh, next Sunday is Independence Day, but that doesn't mean uh, we forget God. It means we really need to put God first. And uh, what this country needs most of all is a turn back to the Lord. And uh, let's be in service for that. So special weekend. Uh, sign up for the men's fishing trip is on the bulletin board and uh, please, I don't know what the deadline is, but I think the guys would like to know that are sponsoring that right away. Which body are you? By the 8th. At midnight. I don't think the church is open during that time. Anyway, nevertheless, uh, hurry up if you can. All right. And uh, let's remember out there in the future, there's a car wash schedule. And uh, I'm sure the young people would appreciate your uh, using their services on that date. There's a special announcement of a baptismal service being planned either for the 11th or the 15th of August. And uh, you're to let Pastor Stetler know if you wish to be baptized. And if you haven't been, I would encourage you to do that. It will be a blessing to you, and it will be a blessing to those who witness that service. I hope I haven't forgotten anything here. But, uh, oh yes, I have. The pastor asked that uh, I announce a short board meeting after church. And I said that when I was pastor and announced such there was always laughter throughout the church. And, uh, short, on the short thing. You know what that means if you're if you're part of that board. This evening we have a trio, Brother and Sister Stetler and Nancy Martin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
She's asking for prayer in communicating with a translator for the first time. And uh, so that's that's a challenge. Uh, I've done it one time and I was scared to death before I did it. But you know, it found out that when you have a pause like that, you get a chance to organize your thoughts before you know what else you're going to say. So also make you preach twice as long. So, but anyway, because <laughs> so, it said twice, everything said twice. But anyway. And unity and a great time with the missionaries that they'll be working with. So keep that in mind, and thanks to Esther for that. So uh, remember Esther this coming week. How long will she be there? A month. All right. So uh, let's remember Esther and Jeremy is there. They're working in the kingdom and in the part of the kingdom that God has called them to. <clears throat> well, I've been talking to you for several services about the life of faith. And, uh, and I'll be honest with you, I don't feel like I have this message as well organized as I wish it were. Every preacher here knows what I'm saying when I say that. And uh, so, but I'll, uh, I'll plow through here and see if we can get through this. I've been talking about the, the journey of faith. It started with Thomas. I will not believe except I see. And Jesus said, blessed are they who believe when they see not. They do not see. Jesus gently led Thomas to faith. We talked about by faith overcoming the odds. Benaiah killed a lion on a snowy day in a pit. The heroes of he Hebrews chapter 11. Anyone facing the odds know that it must be done by faith and faith is not for sissies. There are challenges to a life of faith. Overcoming by faith our fears. I want to come back to John chapter 21. And we began here last time, but I really didn't get to the example of this passage. And I want to do that tonight. You remember the setting of John 21 before this account. The setting was very important in understanding Jesus had been on trial. He had been crucified. Peter had failed. He had denied and cursed. His faith had crumbled. Pretty sobering thing to think about crumbling faith, is it? That would have looked like the end for Peter. Jesus was dead. He had denied. 
But suddenly there was a dramatic change. Jesus was not dead. He was alive. Hope was reborn in Peter. Could Peter's faith be reborn? Could Peter's faith live again? Could Peter be reconditioned as we've been talking about? Let's read John 21. After these things, that's after all of those things I've been talking about. Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. They're together were together Simon, Peter, and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Canaan in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, two other of his disciples. Simon Peter said unto them, I go fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into the sheep ship immediately. That night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, you know, Jesus doesn't waste any detail. Think about that. I'll come back to it later in the message. But this happened when the morning was just breaking. When the morning was now gone. Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any need? And they answered him, No. He said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it from the multitude of Therefore, that disciple whom, disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, as it were, 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then, as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, Fish laid thereon and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of great fishes, 150 and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus said to them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. Now it is the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had died, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Joseph, Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto me, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto them, Him, feed my lambs. He said unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him a third time, Simon, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? What's the, that's the heart of it all, isn't it? That's the heart of it all. I want us to see that's the heart of it all. You don't serve Jesus unless you love him with all of your heart. That's the heart of it all. Look what happened to you. Because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Be my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldst. When thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, and another shall gird thee, and care that carry thee whither thou wouldst not. He this he spake, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto them, Follow me, follow me. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned upon his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? And Peter, seeing him, saith, Which is to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he carry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Jesus could have said to Peter, Peter, just trust me. Peter, trust me with your questions. Trust me with your failure. Trust me with your future. Trust me, Peter. 
Let everyone else do whatever else they're going to do. Peter, you trust me. You love me enough to trust me. Obey me, Peter. Follow me, Peter. I want to tell you, friends, that is robust biblical faith that trusts and obeys and loves and follows. We talked extensively about the conditioned reflex. I'm not going to bore you with repetition. Only to say that I've tried to establish that all of us have been conditioned a lot more than we realize. My point has been we need to condition our reflexes with the right stimuli. We must be careful what we use to condition our hearts. The conditioned reflexes of our heart can be good or bad. Satan wants to condition us with sin and sinful stimulus and guilt and fear and unbelief and pride and bitterness and anger and harshness and lust and pleasure and fear and jealousy and self-centeredness and anger and on and on it goes. God is trying to condition your reflexes, your heart by the Holy Spirit and the renewing of your mind with God's view of sin and God's view of regeneration and God's view of heart purity and God's view of grace and truth and his word and forgiveness and humility and faith and hope and love. You know, friends, some people are having a terrible time being what God wants them to be. Young people, did God help hear me right here? Many people are having trouble being what God wants them to be because they are allowing Satan to program their hearts, their minds. Well, it's important who controls our mind. Last time we looked at numerous scriptures. I'm going to just quickly go through some of them because I, I, I felt this pressed on my heart. Proverbs 23, 7. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. How you program your heart. Mark 12, 30. God says, I must love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, with all of thy soul, mind, with all of thy strength. This is the first command. Do you love me, Peter? Jesus said. Romans 1, 28. And that whole first chapter of Romans talks about those that God says did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They simply didn't like the way God thought about things. And God turned them over to a reprobate mind because they resisted letting God form their heart and their Paul reflects that in Romans 8, 7 when he says, The carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God either. And then Paul in Romans 12, 2 says, Be not conformed to this world. Don't let the world program your heart. Don't let the world program your mind. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that way you can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The only answer is to let the Holy Spirit do it. Well, many people are not ready for the spiritual battle. Because they have not come to grips with who is conditioning their mind. And consequently, they have spiritual faith. I read all those scriptures again because God has pressed on me how important that is. It'd do us well to stop every once in a while and just examine the details of life and ask yourself a simple question. Who programmed that in? Where did that come from, that attitude? That way of seeing things, that worldview, that emotion, that anger, that bitterness, that jealousy, that reaction, that habit, that dress style, the words, the desire to control the outcome. Where did that come? Who programmed that into my mind? Now, here's what I want you to get from this message. We must allow the Holy Spirit To be in control. Yes, sir. If the carnal mind is in control, it will not be what God thinks. Right. Let's 
stop and ask you this question. Do you know your sanctified Lord? Do you know your mind has been renewed? The rest of this message, I want to look at this man, Peter, in the example God gives us. A man whose faith was broken. A man who responded to the stimuli of Satan. A man who had an inward enemy, an inward carnal stimuli that, that got him, caused him to fail. Satan wants us to get caught in the cycle of failure until failure becomes the final word. But what I really want you to see is how God reprogrammed this man. Let's look at it. God reconditioned his reflexes. God brought him back. God restored him. God transformed him inwardly. God renewed his mind. And then God used him in a wonderful, wonderful way. This man Peter. All four Gospels record the story of Peter denying Jesus during the trial. Look at it, a little snapshot of it. Luke 22, 16 says that right as Peter was denying Jesus, the rooster crowed. I tell you again, God doesn't waste any detail. The rooster crowed. Luke 22, 61 says, as the rooster crowed, as Peter denied, the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered. He remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, before the cock crowed, thou shalt deny me thrice. Verse 62 of that 22nd chapter says, Peter went out and he went. A man who failed. This had to be the most painful, painful fa failure of Peter's life. I have to wonder if after this, Peter didn't feel a twinge of guilt every time you heard a rooster crow. You talk about conditioned reflexes. You know how certain stimuli trigger certain memories? A sight, a sound, a smell, a word, and it unlocks some memories that maybe you even thought you had forgotten. I've got to think the sound of a rooster crowing had to have a psychological effect to produce terrible feelings of guilt in this man. You know, it's kind of tough on us city dwellers. To appreciate this city. We don't have roosters in our backyard. At least most of us don't. But if you've ever been, if you've ever been where there was a rooster, <clears throat> you know that roosters rule the roost. And when it comes to the waking moment of a rooster choir. Rooster has an internal clock and there's no snooze button. A rooster crowing would have been a very common experience in Peter's day. Can you imagine what it was like for Peter every morning when a rooster crowed? It was a daily reminder of his failure. It was a daily reminder of that moment when he cursed and swore and said, I don't know Jesus. And Jesus gently turns and looks at him. The rooster's crow brought about a conditioned reflex in Peter, just like Pavlov ringing the bell. It reminded him of his worst failure. Isn't that what the enemy wants to do with us? Satan not only wants you to fail, he wants you to relive that failure over and over and over again. He wants to program you for failure. Yeah. He wants to crow like the rooster every morning. He wants to condition your reflexes with guilt and fear and regret. He wants you to only be able to think about the bitterness and hurt and anger and failure. But remember, Jesus comes to recondition our reflexes. God wants to recondition us by his grace. I want you to look at what Jesus did in Peter's life. Fast forward to John chapter 21. 
This is post-denial, Peter. He says to the other disciples, I'm going fishing. Now there's nothing wrong with going fishing. I think Rick told me he's planning a fishing trip with his grandsons. <laughs> nothing wrong with going fishing. And I suppose it was possible that Peter just wanted to relax a bit and go fishing. But remember, that had been Peter's life. It had not only been his life, it was his livelihood before Jesus called. He had left his nest to follow Jesus. You have to wonder, Peter, since his denial, this is the third time Jesus, we don't know how long since Jesus had risen. But you have to wonder if Peter didn't think, I'm here to roost her every morning. My career as a disciple is done. Might as well go back to what I know. He failed one too many times. He's going back to his former life. Can you imagine what was going on in Peter's mind at that point? Friend, there is nothing Satan would love any more than for Peter to spend the rest of his life fishing on the Sea of Galilee. Satan didn't want Peter to preach on the day of Pentecost. Satan didn't want Peter to become the leader of the early church. Satan didn't want Peter to say, such as I have, I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and rise up and walk. He didn't want to be around on the preaching. Satan didn't want Peter going to the ends of the earth fulfilling the great commission. No, Satan wanted Peter in a fishing boat the rest of his life on the sidelines, neutralized, a failure forever. I want to tell you it doesn't matter what it is. Satan wants you on the sidelines. He doesn't want God's will fulfilled in your life. He doesn't want the miracle of grace to be a reality in your life. He doesn't want God to renew your mind. He doesn't want God to use you. He doesn't want It doesn't matter if the failure is bitterness or fear or unforgiveness or hurt or anger or confusion. Inadequacy, like the rooster crowing every morning for Peter. He wants to condition your reflexes, trigger it in your heart and mind. But look at this. Something beautiful happens to this man, Peter. Jesus reconditions Peter in a profound way. In a sense, he reinstates Peter three times. You know, I've heard a lot of conjecture about, about why Jesus asked him three times. I'm of the personal belief that Jesus were restoring him three times because he had failed three times. I have to believe this is where Peter's forgiveness is clenched in his own heart. Jesus said, Peter, Yes, Lord. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you, Lord. One more time. Do you love me, Peter? Peter's a little offended now this third time. Why does Jesus do it? I'm convinced he's reconditioning Peter's mind. A man who denied him three times. Peter, since your denial, you've been letting the devil play that record in your mind and fired every morning with your crow. Peter, I'm going to recondition, I'm going to reprogram things here. I'm going to give you the grace of forgiveness. It's interesting. Have you noticed when this reinstatement happened? I mentioned this a while ago, verse 4. It says, early in the morning. When do roosters crow? It's early in the morning. <laughs> and Jesus, who knew what Peter needed, early in the morning to say, Peter, you 
been listening to the rooster crow and the rooster failure. But I'm going to give you the grace of forgiveness. I think Jesus reconditioned Peter so that that sound of the rooster's crow was no longer a reminder of his failure and guilt, but a daily reminder of his grace. Maybe someone here tonight needs to re be reminded of the daily reminder of grace. The enemy wants you to wants to remind you of your worst faith. I love what Scott Fitzgerald said. Never confuse a single mistake with a final mistake. The grace of God turns final mistakes into single mistakes. I'm impressed with the people in the Gospels, not who put their faith in Jesus. I'm impressed with the people in the Gospels who Jesus put his faith in. Peter's one. Peter had messed up, but Jesus didn't give up. God wants to recondition our guilt with grace. But that's not all the story. There's more. We cannot overlook the story. God's first step was reconditioning his mind with forgiveness. What's the next step? Peter, I don't want you spending the rest of your life in a fishing boat listening to roosters every morning. Peter, I want you to love me. Peter, I want you to love me. Peter, I don't want you to really love me with all of your heart and soul. Jesus had prepared Peter for this moment. I look at Luke chapter 24, verse 39. Jesus had said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. I look at John 14, 16. Jesus said, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. I look at John 14, 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will sing in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you, the truth is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And Acts chapter 4 and verse, or chapter 1 rather, and verse 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he says you have heard of. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, Peter, I'm restoring you to forgiveness. I'm restoring you from your failure. But Peter, hurry on the Pentecost. You need the baptizing, filling experience of the Holy Ghost coming. You not only need forgiveness that puts failure behind you, you need filling that prepares you for the next chapter. Yeah. The renewing of your mind, Peter, that's what you really need. I not only want you to get beyond the crowing of the rooster, Peter. I want you to be cleansed of the thing that caused your failure. I want you to love me with a pure heart. I want you to, by faith, be purified. And friend, that inward condition comes to the filling of the Holy Spirit and the entire sanctification. History is undeniable. Acts chapter 2. The day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all in one accord in one place. There was a sound of a mighty rushing wind. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Peter Lester later testified, our hearts were purified. How? By faith. Our hearts were purified by faith. Acts chapter 15 and verse 9. Peter was never the same. The ultimate reconditioning. The inward reconditioning. The heart reconditioning. The ultimate transformation of grace. Denying was behind him. Rooster's crowing was behind him. The divided heart was behind him. He was purified by faith. He was sanctified holy. It saved Peter. It changed Peter. It made him useful. The interesting thing is, when God had renewed his mind,
He wants strength to be and be pure and be faithful and be obedient and be a witness. This is what you need. The filling of the Holy Ghost will help you to be. Jesus chooses his words with Peter. Peter, follow me. And after Pentecost, that was never a problem to follow Jesus. Peter never got sidetracked again. He never let circumstances defeat him again. He never took his eyes off of following Jesus again. Well, I say, how the ultimate recondition of the human heart. Let me ask you tonight, do you know that you receive recondition of forgiveness? Do you know the reconditioning of a purified heart? Now, and I don't know where this is going to go from here. I'm going to quit. I want to tell you, the reconditioning of forgiveness and the reconditioning of a pure heart is not the end. It's the beginning. It's not the end. It's the beginning. And God will continue to work, continue to lead, continue to grow, continue to accomplish His will. seek forgiveness. Well, friend, if that's where you need to start, start there. You need to seek forgiveness and restoration. I want to tell you, he'll get you beyond listening to the roof to crow every morning. Don't mind you for Maybe someone says, Brother Stepper, I need recondition on the inside so I can love God with all of my heart and soul and mind. the condition of forgetting the race. You're ready for the recondition of inward purifying by faith and grace. Hungry heart here tonight. Jesus, thank you for your help here tonight. Thank you for the truth of your word. Help us to find lodging in our hearts. Help us to bear fruit in the days that are ahead. We'll give you praise in Jesus' name. God bless you. You're dismissed.